Henry VIII was never meant to be king. If his father, Henry VII's schemes, had come to fruition, we would have had a King Arthur. Perhaps our history books would be filled with stories of the long and happy union of King Arthur and Queen Catherine, who resisted the Lutheran Reformation and allied with Spain. Or perhaps their marriage would have been annulled for non-consummation. But the question we tend to ask about Arthur, whether he and Catherine of Aragon did or did not do the deed, is probably the least interesting thing to ask about him. Here was a young boy who had a financially wealthy, emotionally impoverished existence. A boy groomed for kingship from six years of age. A lad who would never live to be king. Introducing me to Prince Arthur is Dr. Sean Cunningham. He is head of medieval records at the National Archives and one of the leading historians on the reign of Henry VII. There are few people who know the political, military, legal and financial records of the late 15th century better than Sean. And all this shows in his biography, Prince Arthur, the Lost Tudor King. I'm grateful to St Cross College, Oxford, where I recorded this podcast. Sean. Dr. Cunningham, thank you so much for joining me on Not Just the Tudors. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you very much, Susie. I'm really pleased to be here. So we're going to be talking about Prince Arthur, and you are known for your work on Henry VII, and I wondered what had drawn you to want to write about this short-lived prince. It's a really good question because a child who dies at 16 before really fulfilling any potential might seem like an afterthought, especially as we know what happens after he dies and the way Tudor England develops. So partly it is because of that tragic death and that early and unfulfilled life. But I think it's also a fact that what he did pack in and the things he did do had such a lasting impact. Even the manner of his death seemed to have a legacy with his brother and what happened subsequently, because obviously the first marriage to Catherine of Aragon had an afterlife of its own once Arthur was dead, which really influenced how Henry's reign developed and almost how Henry's personality changed. Obviously that couldn't be predicted or planned, but it created a package of possibilities about what Arthur's life would have been like, kind of counterfactual history almost. So although it's another Tudor man, it's still a really interesting possibility about how this influenced the direction that our country took. So let's go back to the beginning for Arthur. 1486, his birth. What is the choice of his name and the choice of Winchester as a place to baptise him? Tell us about the image of the prince that the king, Henry VII, was trying to create. Yes, it's a great revelation, I suppose, about how a Tudor king thinks of his position. In British history, I suppose, the whole of the British Isles and that Arthurian legend relating to the kind of popular culture of the time and Caxton printing the Mort d'Arthur only a few years earlier. So in terms of literary circles, it's a popular image about the kind of long-held rights of the British to be ruled by a British king. And obviously they would see the Plantagenets as being a French dynasty. And Henry is trying to demonstrate that the return of this new dynasty is actually a step right back to the ancient line which he's tried to trace through his own male heritage through his father's line. But it's obviously an attempt to tap into that link and that heritage. And it's also, I suppose, a nod to the Mortimers and their own line through Elizabeth of York, Arthur's mother, who is almost the last of the March Plantagenets, perhaps were named as Richard II's heirs at the end of the 14th century. So Arthur represents that line of Welsh March borderland inheritance too, It's a careful planning of that kind of legacy and that heritage, but it is presented in this massive pageant, symbolism and imagery and badges, a real attempt to kind of flood the market with a new Tudor stamp and brand almost. I think that is something Henry consciously tries to create to reinvent his own dynasty, but almost Arthur is the figurehead for this revitalisation of the crown. In a way, Henry is kind of sacrificing any of his own claims and so is the Queen and pouring all of that into Prince Arthur as the future of where this family is going and uniting the kind of ruling class and hopefully ending the division that had caused quite a lot of civil disturbance for the previous century, if not even earlier. Now, there's one fact that absolutely startled me that I hadn't realised at all before I read your book. And it's a rather dominant theme that from about a month or perhaps six weeks old... Prince Arthur was separated from his parents and he never rejoined them. He spent almost no time with them (laughs) between then and his death. You look at those first few years when he's down in Farnham and being cared for there and you 
track the king's movements. Formally, we can say that he visited his son four times. Maybe the records don't capture all the visits between the boy and his family, and I know you'll say we shouldn't read this as neglect. There's money spent on his care, he's being dressed in the finest fabrics. But even in this context, it's pretty astonishing as a revelation about how he was brought up. Yes, it is. I think you expect a first royal prince of a new dynasty to be given every kind of closeted care. As you see Prince Henry getting, once Arthur is dead, he's brought back into the fold and almost put under house arrest to preserve this inheritance. Maybe Henry had learned from the problems that Arthur's death created, but certainly an infant so young, who obviously won't know anything of what's happening, to be separated, almost left in a vulnerable position, because Farnham, it was a palace, it wasn't a castle, so it wasn't as if Arthur was locked away in a very strong defensive position. Perhaps we might see Margaret Beaufort being more of an influence because she was a lot nearer at Woking than the king would have been at Westminster. So it's an extraordinary kind of story of intent, I guess, in terms of Arthur will be a central focus in his own right for his own household, his own lordship, being trained as a king in waiting from that moment, years before he can actually take up any of these elements of personal power. And I think also maybe there's a part of Henry VII's own background and story in that decision. The fact that he had a restless early life, a life of exile, a very young mother, and a kind of rootlessness in the way his personal life developed, very close to Anne Devereux, who was Lady Herbert, his guardian when he was growing up, in a similar region to where Arthur ended up growing up as well. So Henry realises that he's had a hard knocks of his early life. Maybe some of that is necessary for Arthur to learn how to be self-reliant. But it's astonishing, really, that he wasn't just brought up at court with everyone around him who could guarantee his safety. And maybe Henry felt he wasn't going to be a king for very long because the pressure was already on after 1485 and Bosworth and how his foothold or toehold on power would unravel quickly through the plots and conspiracies he was expecting. And maybe Arthur, as a separate household, a separate figurehead, perhaps to be safeguarded by some nobles with more military might. It's a fascinating start to that kind of dislocated life that Arthur had. I think it seems quite tragic to us that he grew up not knowing a family who were his blood relatives on a daily basis, which anyone would feel the lack of as they moved into their teenage years. By that stage, it's almost too late to recover any of that when he does begin to meet his family more regularly as he can travel safely and frequently, possibly up to London. It shows how he must have been part of the King's plan very early on almost in a cold kind of ruthless planning for the long-term future. And what we need is a king who can look after himself, even as a child, rather than someone who's going to be closeted and prepared in a very pampered way for rule. Yes, and of course, we now know that in psychological terms, it's those early years with parents that help children internalise security and confidence and make them much more able to go out and take on the world. And they wouldn't have known that then. But... I'm even struck by the contrast to his future wife. It's true that royal children were generally not brought up directly by their parents, but you look at the woman we call Catherine of Aragon and the way that she was beside her mother's side nearly all the time, travelling around with that peripatetic court and didn't come to England for so long because her mother doesn't want to let her go. We can't know, of course, but I do wonder how that might have shaped the encounter between those teenagers when they married. Yes, I think Arthur would have appeared as a figure in his own right, almost separated from the king's court and household. In that sense, he wouldn't have seemed like he was part of the family group. So I don't know whether Catherine felt that, yes, he didn't seem to be part of sort of England's projection of power at the time, almost. The king has negotiated this for a long time, almost as soon as Arthur's born, these negotiations start with Ferdinand and Isabella. So the plan is always in place when it comes to the personalities of the people actually involved. It's quite a contrast, isn't it? I think Catherine comes across as a very determined and well-educated and confident teenager. Arthur, even at that moment, still seems a bit shadowy and we don't really know what he's like. We can guess from reports of his behaviour and his ability to orate in various languages and his confidence with the Mayor of London and his ability to talk to bishops and visit the Earl of Shrewsbury one weekend and then the Duke of Buckingham the next. He's confident in the ways we'd expect him to be, but I think Catherine comes with a lot more than possibly we appreciate in England because I think that backstory of her Spanish upbringing is in contrast to Arthur's. He would have learned more about the way England was run because of what subsequently happened to Henry VII, had he been nearer the centre of power and seen all of those adjustments to the crises that beset the king right through till 1500. 
It wasn't really a period of more than a few months when things didn't seem to be heading into some sort of tumult and crisis. So I think Arthur would have learned a lot more about how to manage all of that. And obviously Catherine had seen a lot of that in Spain in the 1490s as well, and how her mother managed the policy of the Reconquista and all of that and the Inquisition. So there's an awful lot of vast there between a kind of quiet life learning the ropes without any real threat that Arthur experiences, as opposed to what his father and his mother having to deal with, and then in contrast to what his wife actually brings to England as a kind of experience of being a politician as well as a royal figure. I think Arthur seems somehow to be lacking in that full range of experience by the time he's being almost set in place to become a king-in-waiting rather than just a prince learning the trade. In those early years, you mentioned that he was nearer his grandmother, Margaret Beaufort, than his father. Can we see her influence, and indeed the influence of his mother, on the choice of those who cared for him in their place? There's a little bit of that. There are quite a lot of the names you can pick up from the royal household accounts of people being appointed to his positions. We can see some of them have come through Margaret Beaufort Reginald Bray network, which has been built up around Margaret's estates at Woking for a long time, right from the 1470s, really, when her marriage to Lord Stanley begins to stabilise her position. But I certainly think when you see Margaret's ability to pull the strings for other people around the king, appointing various clerics that she's worked with, people she's educated in her household, they all move into quite powerful positions. And I think it would be very unlikely that she hasn't influenced how Arthur's household is going to be developed, simply because she is pulling the strings on things like the service manuals for household hierarchy and precedence and how the royal family is to be elevated above everybody else and everyone is to perform a ritualistic service to emphasise that separateness and that higher authority of the royal family. At some point, you begin to see this network of young, almost second sons of the aristocracy beginning to find places around Arthur's service as friends first, maybe, but then as companions, almost setting up a network for when he will become king and has this group of sure friends to rely upon when it comes to running the country. So again, that's an adjustment for Henry VII to think about the things he lacked when he became king. No friends, really. People who almost became his followers through expediency because they wanted to recover their lands from Richard III after the 1483 rebellion that the Duke of Buckingham led, possibly to gain the crown for himself. You can see the dynamics of politics moving through the way everyone was thinking about where they should place their loyalty. And I think Arthur's kind of setup for his household is an extension of that, thinking about the best way to ensure a stable network around the king is to build that up from the grassroots, almost from childhood companionship. It's better than trying to bring people in almost when their status is already set and their independent power is already part of their armoury of lordship. I think Arthur and Henry VII want to control that growth within the parameters that the king is setting, the way he wants to rely on people and build that trust and ensure that loyalty stays in place. So Margaret Beaufort is close to advising the king in all of those blueprints for how the regime is taking shape. And I think Arthur is very much part of that package because of the investment in the way that his development is structured during the first 10 years of his life. I can't believe that Margaret wouldn't have been extremely interested in seeing how her grandson grows into his role as prince and then potentially as king from age 15, 16. I think that's possibly the moment that they envisaged him as being able to rule in his own right, which is why the wedding takes place as it does in 1501. It all feels somewhat accelerated. And we have him at the age of three being created a knight and prince of Wales. Instead, we've got this small boy, and this is one of these snapshots we have of him, serving the king's dinner, riding his horse, indeed leading a company of riders to Westminster Hall, making his first ceremonial pronouncement. I speak as the mother of a three-year-old. I can see that this would be possible for a three-year-old, but it's also a huge responsibility for his age, isn't it? That's right. By that stage, his development is still opaque. We can't really see that, but that's a kind of first marker of how far he'd come and how intense it must have been for him to know his position, know what's expected, know the kind of baggage that his parents or certainly his father is putting upon him to take this responsibility forwards. So bringing a small child into that kind of storm of diplomacy and dynastic uncertainty, partly it's to demonstrate that there is a future for the regime. On the other hand, he's still being kept distant because that possible destruction of things is still on the cards and at least it gives them a second front almost, either to move to or to whisk away before any kind of attack on London would have happened. So it's a symptom of the uncertainty, but it's also a demonstration of the future direction maybe and the assessment of maybe where Arthur has got to. 
And certainly in a couple of years after that, in 1493, I think it is, when he's aged about five and a half, he goes to Ludlow, almost a ceremonial entry into his own lordship. And again, it's supported by the great and the good of the regime, Jasper Tudor, the Duke of Bedford, the king's uncle, and various earls, Earl of Arundel, his, his godfather, Earl of Shrewsbury, providing the military muscle. So there's a sense that this is a starting point of a progression of an increase in his visibility, um, his kind of public status and the strength and obvious support for him as a lord in his own right. It really starts from this 1489 ceremonial knighting and the birth of his sister and how that is a kind of probably the first real cause for celebration other than not being deposed in all of these rebellions. I guess to see it as a thing that's a positive step and it shows more acceptance and it gives them more options as a family. So, yes, that next snapshot that we have is, as you've said, 1493, he moves to the Welsh marches at Ludlow Castle and you describe him presiding over, to what extent a five-year-old to do this, but presiding over a session of the peace held at Hereford Castle. And again, we have this really strong sense of him being trained in isolation. You mentioned that you think this might be a deliberate attempt by the king to recreate the challenges of his own upbringing that he felt perhaps had prepared him for the throne. There's also, you mentioned the possibility that they're following a precedent here with what had happened with the previous Prince of Wales, Edward V, in terms of his training. Although, of course, the end of that story is not a good one, so it's a strange precedent to follow. But do you think that's part of it as well? Yes, I think that's right. I think it emphasises again the Tudor connection to the Plantagenet way of doing things. So that heritage of being a royal family is embedded in the way previous royal families have trained their children and given them the political experience. It's an interesting aspect of his upbringing that Henry VII really sees what's gone before, tries to make a change, but is still using the Yorkist Plantagenet way of doing things because that legitimises the whole Tudor enterprise in terms of right to rule, fitness to rule, the proper kind of training. It's part of the package of saying, we're here, we might have won a battle to become monarchs, but actually we're part of the same heritage. This is why we're here to stay, because we know that we're part of this long line of kings and we're not trying to do anything different. But clearly, I think the snapshots we have of Arthur in public, where people are commentating on how he looked, how he held himself, the conversation he had, his ability to look commanding, to engage quite senior figures such as town mayors of Coventry or Chester or London and individual nobles who were familiar at court. I think all of that kind of evidence of Arthur shows that he was trained well and that he was intelligent and then he had enough learning to adjust his kind of presentation of himself to different audiences, as we'd expect a kind of politician to do at this time. We'll never really know exactly what people felt, but clearly the amount of investment in Arthur's training and development must have created some kind of polished figure at the end, especially as by the time he's 15, he's in a position to make this wedding and almost take up the reins of power. And we know from the few records of the council in the marches when he's connected to it that he's aware of the kind of legal responsibilities. He knows how to look at the estate accounts of the earldom of March, which he takes up in 1494. So he's managing the mustering of his own troops that Sir Richard Pohl brings to various campaigns on his behalf when he's too young. But all of these are the elements and the trappings of how an aristocratic leader learns his position and actually takes control over the resources they have on behalf of the king. And Arthur seems to be in very much the same stamp as all the other senior figures. People trust his position, believe in him, not just because he's the heir of the regime, but actually because he is hopefully a likeable and fair kind of lord. I would imagine that's a result of that training and education, but we really don't know the ins and outs of it all. But it's fair to say, isn't it, that because of the lack of surviving documents, we don't know much about his character, do we? I was struck by your phrase, we cannot know if he was a lonely boy, because it implied that perhaps you think that maybe he was. Yeah, I think so. And it's only at his funeral you see all of the evidence of which younger sons of lords were there with him. And maybe that was a very recent thing, possibly even an adjustment to allow for household when Princess Catherine is there in 1501, but it's the Earl of Kildare's son, John Lord Grey, the Marquis of Dorset's second son, second Lord Willoughby. There's various people whose families are strong around Henry VII or have been very important political figures. 
they look to be companions is part of that link between the 15th century lords who come back almost to power with Henry Tudor in 1485. Then they have that position around the court. Some of them get promoted and ennobled, others don't. And then the sons of those families are almost directed to Prince Arthur's household to become the next generation of loyalists almost. So I think it'd be nice to think that the evidence of the emotional kind of loss that Arthur's death leaves for these friends was a genuine kind of feeling. And even when you jump even further to the kind of evidence at the divorce hearings in 1528-29, the people who were there at the wedding night... It is that group of friends commenting on Arthur's, how he held himself, how drunk he was, how loud and boisterous he was, which suggests they were part of his kind of social group and were friends. It's an interesting question. Again, we would only find evidence for that if there was a kind of reflection in other people's writing rather than just the long range memories of people in the late 1520s trying to think back almost 30 years and basing that evidence as evidence of that earlier friendship network, I think is problematic. Because of this lack of evidence, people turn often to the portraits and draw conclusions about character. So what can we tell from the portraits of Arthur and what do you think we should resist concluding? The purpose for the portrait would immediately give you some idea of how Arthur will be presented. So if it was a wedding portrait, then he will obviously look healthy and strong and resemble his father and look like the form of a prince suitable for a joint kingdom. But he would have been born a couple of weeks prematurely and people have invested a kind of trail, therefore, that he was maybe sickly and possibly he died because of that reason. I don't think in the snapshot evidence of his childhood that there is much to say he wasn't active. The horse riding and the delivery of bows and the kind of trappings of outdoor life which are being purchased for him and sent up to wherever he's living at the time shows an active childhood. So there's nothing immediately obvious to suggest he wasn't a healthy and active young prince. The portraits show a family resemblance to his father, the kind of same sunken eyes, the same straight nose, angular face. I don't know what you can really say about what a picture suggests about a personality. It's so tempting to look into the eyes and read someone's personality from what we know the events of their period alive and reveal about them, but it's quite dangerous to look for those traits in a physical representation of them. I think you're absolutely right, but there is often a tendency to think about Tudor portraits as if they were somehow photographs. People talk about the sort of look that you can see in their eyes and this sort of thing, and it makes me roll my eyes. Now, given the fact that we do have this kind of absence of evidence, it feels to me that rather like a shipwrecked sailor finding land, you must have gratefully fallen upon the detailed account that survives of the events of 1501 to 1502, the arrival of Catherine, the daughter of Isabel and Ferdinand, to marry Prince Arthur. So can you tell us a little bit about that source and what we know about Arthur's first encounter with his wife-to-be? It's a great source, probably a herald's account of everything and a compilation of various bits of information which is in the College of Arms, so it's very much an official account, but it's so detailed about the things the author witnessed, but also the information they gathered together, because obviously Catherine arrives a little bit later than she should have done. She arrives in Plymouth and not Southampton. London is already set up for a wedding, which then has to be delayed, so you can imagine the traffic chaos must have been awful. All these pageants were set up at various points in the city to go through a lot of the symbolism of the match, commentaries on cosmology and star constellations and Catherine as divine kind of representations of their earthly presence and all of this. So it's very much the symbolism of lordship and power linked to God's selection of these young people to be rulers. So it's a bit of a breakneck journey for Catherine across the south of England She's at the mercy of the local gentry, first of all, and you can see the letters and the payments in the royal accounts for getting members of the king's household down there as quickly as possible to begin this appropriate kind of escort for the princess to London. I think everyone is a bit caught out. So I think Richard Fox has a lot to do with this, the Bishop of Winchester, who's done a lot of the organising of the pageants on the king's perambulations around the country already. So there's a very much an element of the required components of these ceremonials. So there's the symbolism and the pageantry and the badges and the union of the two states. And then at the heart of this is the two teenagers who are, you would think, quite bewildered and overawed by this. Certainly for Catherine, she arrives. The only common language they seem to have is Latin. <laughs> I think Arthur doesn't really know much French, and I don't know if Catherine does either. He certainly doesn't have any Spanish. 
and they try Latin and Catherine is kind of <laughs> alarmed at the way Arthur pronounces his Latin, so they really can't communicate in that either. And they meet at the Bishop of Bath's palace at Dogmersfield in Hampshire about 10 days before their wedding in November, early weeks of November. So it's a strange kind of encounter, I guess, in that there's been correspondence between them, some personal letters maybe, but certainly official letters and everything you could expect in terms of reporting and the proxy weddings and how the appearance of the prince is marvellous and he will be such a worthy son-in-law. But eventually it's two people meeting and actually trying to communicate with each other, getting a sense of who they are and how they're going to relate to each other and what their marriage life will be like. And the Herald's account is there at that time and it gives us snapshots of kind of a reception and maybe some card playing and some dancing. Yeah, it's quite an intimate little portrait of that first meeting. The king is hovering in the background as well, trying to orchestrate it, but at some point they have to be left getting acquainted with each other. And Arthur's arrived in his finest riding clothes. Catherine is being dragged across the muddy lands of southern England. I think she's probably quite exhausted. And the fact that she's having to speak in a foreign language and she has to have interpreters. And she's got a whole entourage, which is quite a large entourage, I would imagine. Possibly already been scattered by the kind of storm which delayed her and blew her into the wrong port. So there's a sense of reassembling the official Spanish embassy almost that she's very much at the forefront of but it's moving towards this already pre-planned and set up series of pageants in London and at various points along the way more and more senior nobles and figures of the regime are meeting her and I think she meets Prince Henry outside of Croydon on the ride into the Bishop's Palace at Croydon and then up through Lambeth to London Bridge only a couple of days before the wedding itself. So it's a breakneck thing. I don't think she has a moment to spare other than these overnight stops at the occasional inn and abbey, some of which still have you know, the signs on the door saying Catherine of Aragon stayed here November the 4th, 1501 kind of thing. So her introduction to England is in no way stately or comfortable. It's the pressure of getting prepared almost as she's travelling for this wedding ceremony to fit into the very grandest of preparations for a public spectacle which is going to celebrate this extremely high-level alliance between Aragon, Castile and England, already set up to counter the French and navigate around the Burgundians. So it's very much high politics. In itself, it's the biggest public spectacle that they've seen in terms of a royal wedding, probably since the 14th century. It's a really big deal for the regime and no expenses spared in terms of setting it up. So these pageants are truly amazing and the Herald really goes to town and explaining in great detail, much more so than would have been apparent at the time, what the symbolism is. It's a direct representation of God's connection to these two figures. Can you describe that spectacular wedding? You get a really good sense of old St Paul's being packed almost to the rafters with people, and they're coming from the adjacent Bishop of London's palace, so the walkway is covered in cloth, and they're both dressed in white satin, which is almost reflective, so you get a sense that they're dazzling, literally, not to mention the jewels, and Catherine has her own style, the Spanish style of dress. And they've built a kind of raised walkway right down the nave of the cathedral, so everyone can literally see them almost at shoulder height. Everything is hung with tapestries and cloth of gold. There's an endlessly flowing wine fountain outside. You've got these mobile kind of floats driving around. One is an island which has real trees on it and pomegranates growing on trees, her symbol. So they've really thought about matching the symbolism of the families into the pageantry. There's an immense amount of gold plate for people to eat the wedding banquet off. There's been a huge amount of rebuilding in the Bishop's Palace, but also in Westminster Hall, where there's another banquet later on and the jousting takes place. So a complete refurbishment of the royal space has happened. Richmond Palace has just been finished that summer. So again, you've got a brand new Renaissance Palace down the river as well. There's a really good account of the works that had happened over the previous two years to reset Westminster Palace in a similar way with lots of new statues, lots of new glazing lots of coloured gilded bosses everywhere. So the symbolism of Tudor badges has gone into overdrive almost. And at the King's Landing, at the stairs to the river, where the boats all land, the mooring posts have all been redesigned with royal badges and heraldry on top as well. So in terms of colour and spectacle, on a what probably was quite a grim November day, maybe it was sunny, I don't think they mentioned the weather, but it probably wasn't raining. 
It's extremely dazzling. It's extremely expensive. You almost get accounts of the cash boxes being carried around, the yeoman of the crown and the yeoman of the guard doing their best to keep the crowds at bay. But it's over a couple of weeks of activity. The Herald goes through day by day. I think there's even a kind of Cirque du Soleil kind of experience with tumblers and tightrope walkers alongside the jousting. So it's well worth a read because it's not only a snapshot of how the regime wanted to project its power, but you do get a sense of how Londoners engaged with the kind of elite of society at the time. They were allowed into the jousting field. They were allowed to watch all of this happening. And all those people involved really went to town on their involvement and their roles. So as a high point of celebration, it clearly was the pinnacle for Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. They'd removed Perkin Warbeck the previous year, the end of 1499, executed the Earl of Warwick, the kind of figurehead for a lot of the plotting from the 1480s onwards. Probably a wholly innocent figure, but nevertheless charged with trying to aid Warbeck in another plot. The end of that threat allows the wedding to go into its final stages of planning and Ferdinand agrees to send Catherine over. Henry VII certainly invests all of that time in making this a spectacular public event. And you can see the echoes of it in the river pageants later in the 16th century and the way subsequent royal marriages and events staged. I think it becomes a bit of a blueprint for these public and royal crossover events where everyone is meant to celebrate the achievements of the state almost negotiating these big things. Now I'm going to do something rather counterintuitive in that I'm not going to dwell on what did or didn't happen on the wedding night. Let's move on instead to think about what we know about those months of their married life, which I think is actually not that much. But here we have Arthur now returning to Ludlow at some point after this grand wedding. Now not only with a wife, but a whole company of women in tow. What must this have been like? Yes, it must have been extremely strange in that we can see after the wedding in the first couple of weeks of December, the kind of winding down of the Spanish presence. So there's gift giving, there's some nice little vignettes of Henry offering rings to all the Spanish ladies, there's a purchase of paintings and books. So there's clearly an attempt to send off most of the Spanish embassy in very good terms. But there's a household contingent that stays with Catherine. And I think they certainly travel up, if not for Christmas, and certainly in the winter months, they get to Ludlow, certainly for the start of 1502. Ludlow Castle is big enough to hold quite a big household and there's a, another house at Tickenhill, Budley, on the River Severn, which was an old Richard Duke of York house. So Arthur had been given that, it had been rebuilt as well. So how comfortable that journey would have been? Probably not very comfortable in the cold winter months, but it meant that they were pretty much locked up together, certainly in January, February 1502. We have absolutely no idea, really, who was there, other than the people who then become part of Catherine's household during the sort of interregnum of her status after Arthur dies, before Henry VIII becomes king. We get more and more information as her status gradually increases as the second marriage is proposed and then planned for. And obviously her connection to Henry grows through 1505, 6, 7. But that first few years, we can only just grasp a few names and see how the legacy of that 1502 early month kind of period echoes down her subsequent relationship to the Tudor family. So it's very frustrating, but they show very little of the personality and the presence. I think we can see from Arthur's funeral that she probably was ill at the same time as whatever killed him. She had a role in the funeral that was abandoned because she was still too ill to travel on the procession from Ludlow to Worcester. There's quite good accounts of the payments for all of that stuff for the hearse and the embalming and the candles and all the mourning cloth, which gives it little slivers of information about her status and her household status at the time. Incidentally, that's when Arthur's nurse comes back into the picture from 1486. She's still a person of high status around Arthur, even though he's 15 now. So nevertheless, that connection to the women in his early life is still there in his funeral records. So that's a nice thing to say that the presence and the thread of connection was still going strong. And I think the same thing would have been the case for Catherine. She'd have relied on those people she knew and the specific people selected to be her companions would obviously have been there and a great comfort to her. But it would have been nice to see some really good evidence of that household combining together and beginning to take shape as a separate Anglo-Spanish enterprise, which it must have been like because 
Arthur had his own teenage structure that existed before the wedding and Catherine came with people she was comfortable with who her mother and father had basically selected to be her rocks in this new country where she would be learning everything from scratch. So it clearly was very well planned and set up to be of benefit as much as possible to both young people. But we just don't see anything in that moment of how it was structured and how it worked. So Arthur, as you mentioned, does of course die in April 1502, just five months after the marriage. What are the theories about his cause of death and what do you find most plausible? There is an outbreak of sweating sickness in Worcester and in the marches and it closes down the city at the time of the funeral. So the obvious thing to do is to suggest he was a victim of that. And there's other theories that he might have had cancer, he might have had another disease, he might have had some sort of longer term lingering thing. He did perform at the Maundy Thursday service at Easter, so he was well enough to do that publicly, but seemed to have a very sudden end on the 2nd of April. So it's right at Easter time. It's difficult to say because obviously trying to read medical diagnoses in verbal accounts or written accounts of observers who weren't doctors and trying to read in late medieval medical observance and diagnostics is very problematic. We can certainly see there was an epidemic of sorts in that region. He'd been engaged in a public space with a lot of different people just before he died. The temptation is to say, yes, he caught the sweating sickness and it's quite a rapidly acting disease, as Thomas Cromwell's wife and children demonstrate a bit later on. And it's quite a virulent and dangerous disease for various places. And I think that's what I'd say Arthur was a victim of. Anything else might have to still be kept in consideration, but until we find more information, it's impossible to say. Yes, to give listeners an idea of the sort of information one has to deduce the medical conclusion from, the text says, the most pitiful disease and sickness that with so sore and great violence had battled and driven in the singular parts of him inward. And that's it, friends. That's what we've got to go on. (laughs) So all sorts of theories have been built up on the basis of these few words. And yet, obviously, really, there isn't conclusive evidence there. What we do know about his death is how his parents reacted. Yes, so they were at Greenwich Palace and a rider was sent from Ludlow racing across the country and arrived in a couple of days, if not three days. And so Henry receives the news very early in the morning and his confessor is the person who manages the first impact of this with the king and then they go to the queen and reveal the news. And again, Harold is handily placed to record this And it is a kind of devastating, immediate impact of the loss of someone they haven't really been close to physically, and we don't know about emotionally, but nevertheless, it's your eldest child, and anyone would feel that loss immediately and very painfully. On the other hand, it's an unravelling of all of those plans for the previous 15 years, and it's that combination of throwing the whole dynasty back into uncertainty. Obviously, there is another range of children now available to carry things forward but so much has been invested in Arthur's training his network his experience and having had the wedding and gone over that hurdle of presenting him as a king in waiting to the Spanish allies building that confidence that together this marriage is going to rule effectively all of that is suddenly exploded with this news so it's completely devastating to the king and the queen And there's a lot of retiring to private chambers and I would imagine a few days of real intense pain before we begin to see an emergence and a readjustment. And we see it again when, just over a year later, the Queen dies and Henry literally locks himself away for about a month. He is completely broken by that. If Arthur's death was a kind of reduction back to starting points, then the Queen's death is twice as bad for the King and the royal family that are left. So we could only begin to imagine what it's like when you haven't had your child around you, basically given them a life of training and responsibility and emphasising their public role as political leaders. And the thing you haven't invested in or been able to invest in is that emotional connection as a family unit, because for rulers at that time, the political stability and surviving was more important than actually building that family network, because staying in power was the thing that underpinned everything else. And we have to see it in those terms, certainly for a usurping dynasty like the Tudors, the under threat, seeing enemies behind the curtains and on the battlefields or in the towns of the country. So Arthur's death is a 
massive problem, not just for the loss personally, but for the complete rebuilding of the plans for the future that have to then be made. My last question for you is a hypothetical one. In a few words, can you paint a picture of some of the things that might have been different had Arthur lived? You have to think about what his brother would have done and his role in the higher levels of the royal family. If we imagine Arthur living to, say, I don't know, 1540, maybe, as a 60-something-year-old, that covers an awful lot of ground that Henry VIII now fills very enormously. The same pressures externally would have still been there, I guess. However much England under Arthur tried to shape diplomatic politics around, you still had the emergence of the reforming movement in Germany, you still had the wars in Italy, you still had the Spanish expansion, the Portuguese expansion into America and around Africa. So that kind of bigger picture would have been the same for a King Arthur to exist in. I think having a King Arthur in itself would have created all sorts of interesting dynamics about Englishness, Britishness, the kind of Celtic heritage. Maybe it would have changed something about relationships in the British Isles between Scotland and the Irish territories and Wales, but we can't say what they would have been. There probably wouldn't have been any pressure to dissolve the monasteries because Arthur, you would imagine, would not have needed a divorce. Although clearly, if the intention was for Catherine to get pregnant in that five months after the wedding, it didn't happen. And that was a whole problem that was then picked over in the later 1520s. They probably tried to have a baby because it would have probably been part of the instructions for securing the dynasty even further, because then that's an extension of that separate household and network that creates two positions of power for the regime, one of which is Henry VII going forward into old age without these kind of dragging pressures and disappointments that he did have to deal with in his final five years, with Arthur dying and then the Queen dying, and then Prince Henry being closeted as the only kind of male heir. So I think seeing Arthur surviving, heading off all of those issues. You might have had Henry VII living a bit longer. You certainly wouldn't have had the Queen dying in childbirth because it wouldn't have been the need for her to get pregnant age 37 and try and secure another child as a kind of insurance policy for the regime going forwards. This is the hard-headedness of the politics at the time. We don't know what King Arthur would have been like, but you could imagine he'd be much more like Henry VII than Henry VIII was. Personality-wise, he hadn't been brought up at the court in the capital and around London. He had a network, certainly, of provincial nobles who would have spent some time at court, but it was a separate centre. It wasn't a metropolitan centre. Although it was a centre of learning, you clearly didn't have access to the same resources that London merchants supplied to the royal household at Westminster or Richmond or Greenwich or Elton. So it's a very different kind of origin he's coming from. It might have been a little bit more austere, but he certainly would have been aware of the need for magnificence in the same way Henry VII was, spending where necessary, always thinking of policy. He would have followed that blueprint much more closely. In his funeral procession, the banners of Guienne and Normandy as well. So I think the intention of renewing the Hundred Years' War would have still been part of his thinking. And Henry VIII leaps onto that in 1512-13 as well. But I think Arthur would have done the same kind of thing. He certainly ensured that his troops were very much present in the Battle of Blackheath in 1497, for example. It's a big contingent of cavalry. So he's aware of the military importance of just defending his father's kingdom at the time, but actually of being a military leader. So I think he's learned that element of his role as well. And I think that would have been a strong part of his identity. Possibly not as enthusiastic as Henry VIII for war and certainly not as willing to look at that blueprint of Henry V or Edward III as a military leader. It might have been a little bit more considered. It might have been done much more in terms of diplomatic package that Henry VII had managed with the various Holy Leagues and navigating around the shifting alliances over the wars in Italy, trying to balance the Spanish view of their importance in Europe, bankrolled by the discoveries of gold and silver in the New World. I think maybe Arthur might have had a different view of that opportunity because obviously he's England's connection to Newfoundland and the North Atlantic exploration was neglected by Henry VIII as a royal enterprise, certainly. It was given over to private entrepreneurs almost and I wonder if Arthur might have seen that differently because of his Spanish marriage, his kind of direct links to Ferdinand and Isabella. So yes, it's a tricky thing to do but it's really interesting and important to think through these things because you can immediately then see the roots by which some of Henry VIII's personality traits and his decision-making stem back to the fact that he was put into this role as Prince of Wales when he wasn't expecting to be. Thank you so much for introducing us to Prince Arthur. As you 
call him in the subtitle of your book, The Tudor King That Never Was. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much. Thank you to my producer, Rob Weinberg, and researcher, Esther Arnott. And thank you to you for listening to Not Just the Tudors from History Hit. If you haven't already done so, do sign up to our weekly newsletter, Tudor Tuesday, so that you never miss out on the history you love. There are details in the notes below this podcast. And please rate this podcast wherever you listen, now including on Spotify. And please send me your comments and suggestions for future podcasts via our Twitter feed at NotJustTudors or by email NotJustTheTudors at HistoryHit.com.